All right, welcome back to Marketing for the Small Business. This is a very special episode. I'm your host, Braden Cruz, recording here at the Blue Studio in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Join the TikTok Live, the Sooner CEO of TikTok. You can ask him questions and see some behind the scenes, look at what the studio looks like and uh, some cool things. Ask some questions and, and we'll be happy to answer live. We're about to go deep dive into the ocean uh, of courage, determination, and resilience. In this thrilling episode, we sit down with a retired U.S. Navy SEAL and renowned professional photographer with Darren Burnett and the esteemed co-host Pamela Stukenborg from Stukenborg Photography. We can get an exclusive glimpse into the upcoming event, Uncommon Grit, that's on June 2nd, 2023 at the Foundations Church, Broken Arrow, Oklahoma. Now, David McBee is what he also goes by. Actually, it's... Darren, right. Darren Mick Burnett. Darren Mick Burnett. Yeah. But yeah. he also goes by Mick B. Mick B's easier. Mick B. Yeah. So just Mick B's Mick B's easier from yeah. Mick B. Easier. So you just <laughs> completed a 24 year career as a Navy SEAL, right? And you're a speaker, motivator, presenting to multiple companies and groups, including CDW, Budweiser, um, Hilton Hotels, your uh, Fidelity Investments, and many others. You're an also an award winning photographer. Professional portfolio, including work from like Nike, National Geographic, Fox and Friends, Rolling Stones, um, and the movie Act of Valor. And uh, we've seen your work appeared on everything from the album covers to billboards to walls to Fortune 500 companies and um, Kid Rock, John Rich, Brent Burns, and John Daly. And I've got your book here, Uncommon Grit. You came out with this. What year did you? Did 2019 you this? that came out. 2019. How long did it take you to produce this? Mm, it was, well, it's kind of, I, I want to say four years because the project, the project was only uh, six buds classes, but like I said, it wasn't supposed to be a book at all. It was just supposed to be imagery for Naval Special Warfare. And it was my last uh, year and a half in. And so <clears throat> the images, uh, we go to the PAO office. Uh, that's public affairs, and we'd go through everything. And and the the you know just I just had stacks of, of, of photos, and uh, and you just when I had Instagram when I started Instagram in 2016, all I did is I my buddy Rob O'Neill we got together and he had just started Instagram. He said you need to do this for your photography. He's like okay, dude. And so I did like one photo a week, just put it on there. And then the following just just exploded from there, and I didn't didn't even expect it, but it did. And then it, these images lived in Instagram world for sixteen like three years, and so. But the Instagram world, we're like, you should, I get comments all the time. You should do a book. You should do a book. And I'm like, I don't, number one, I don't think I can. Uh, but two, uh, why? I, I just you know it's a photography book, and if that was the big thing about photography books or photography, is if you go in Barnes and Noble, those things don't sell. They're the ones that are like 99% off as you walk in. It's like nobody buys photography books unless you're an actual photographer going to conferences and you give a speech and you sell them. So to me, it wasn't anything that I wanted to do. Plus, I didn't know, I didn't have all of BUDS either. I didn't have all of our SEAL training. We didn't have all three phases. You just had one. We had, I had two. And if I'm not mistaken, two. it's pretty hard to capture those moments. Not if you're a SEAL. <laughs> really? <laughs> Because for me, it's like I tell people all the time, they're like, uh, God, how did you like look through it? It's like people say, oh, it's got clothes. How did you do that? It's like, how do, how do you know to capture those moments? It's because I cheated. They're like, what? Because I went through buds. I know exactly when they're going to quit. I know exactly every evolution. I know what's going to happen. So it's really easy for me to know to get those moments because I went through it. So, but somebody who never went through SEAL training, they have no idea what they're looking at. And they'll just try to capture it from like whatever view that they think is a cool artistic view or whatever from a photographer's standpoint, but anybody I, can pick up a camera. Yeah. Take a photo. Exactly. Well, we all have iPhones and Androids <laughs> yeah, that take exactly. pictures, but it's an art to capture the emotions of mm -hmm. whatever the picture is trying to compel. Right. And not only did you go through buds in 1996, but you also were an instructor too. Yeah. So I was basically, <laughs> like really it, it was just a small <laughs> subsidiary tasker that I got from the leadership that wanted something for, you know, for a new recruiting video for uh, the new, uh, advanced uh, training command that was being built down the just down the strand from buds and so it wasn't like it was this okay here we are this is a big project it was like yeah it was a big project for 
them and the uh, scout team, which is basically SEAL recruiting for SEAL, SWIC, and EOD. But to me, it was like, you know, I had a bunch of cameras and everything. And just, we get on the truck, you, the lads or whatever evolution they're doing, O-course, uh, pool events, running, surf passage, you know, we just do our normal instructor duties. But then if I saw something that was kind of unique and it happened, I'm like, I just grab a camera out, you know, or get in the water, grab my fins, get in the water with them, get out in the ocean with them, you know, just get in the pool with them, you know, and just find those one moments that I yeah. knew would suck. <laughs> and, you know, that's one of the things with Darren's book and the images. When you see a pool image, when he's down there, he's down there in the water with the camera. I've looked through the book photos. Yes. Yeah. If and you guys haven't seen the book photos yet, you guys need to go buy the book. It's like, mm -hmm. do a quick shout out. Where is it? Where can I get it? It's on Amazon, right? It, it's, it is on all the, like, you're, you can get you can get it at Barnes & Noble, Amazon, if you wanted to. You, you can actually go to my website and get it. Uh, uh, McB at dmcburnett.com because there I can actually personalize it for you. Right. And 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 uh, half the proceeds go to my charity, uh, Uncommon Grit Foundation that, you know, we take care of like military family members, veterans, first responders, police officers, firefighters, their families. So it's easy to go through my website and get it. But yes, you can get it at Amazon and Barnes & Noble. When did you start Uncommon Grit Foundation? We started 2020. We started that. Okay. So... It was just uh, something we wanted to do to give back because the book was so successful. So let's just take some of those funds and you know, give them back to, um, you know, to, to first responders. The fact that, you know, uh, especially we've lost so many people and I've lost so many friends. It's, you know, you just got to stay in the fight and take care of those who carry us. So still take care of them while, while, uh, while we move on. Yeah. What's, what's your favorite part of the book? You know, my favorite part of the book is, I'll be honest with you, is the beginning is when I'm writing about the evolutions because I didn't have a ghost writer or anything else. All I had was like my view of going through. And so I love this whole introduction area. Yeah. And the pages. evolution. So if you go in the book, there you go. Now I'm talking about every evolution in there. See, this was cool. When, when you showed me the book, like you go through everything from uh, hell week and, and abbreviations are all these um, pull-ups, push-ups, of course, mm -hmm. two mile ocean swims, not tying the bell, drown proofing. Yeah. So if you, and, and I write, that's a legend. So when you go in there, now you can read about each one of them. And that's me writing about my Bud's experience and your experience at Bud's. And it's first person. So it's not ghost written. It's not other people thinking what it was. That's from my point of view, which was fun to write, by the way. <laughs> but what I get all the time is I ask them, did you read it? And like, no, I just look at the photos. It's like, okay. So what I have is that's actually a cool photo right there. Hold, hold that, hold that thought one second. I'll finish this other thing. What I love about the, what I love about it is the fact that no one's read it. Like literally no one, like, I mean, I don't, I don't say no one, but I'll say everyone I talk to, it has a book has said the same thing. I was like, I always, I make it a point to ask if they read it and nobody has, no one's said, no, yeah, I read it. Like, Oh, I'll read it. It's like, no, you won't. Braden, have you read it? Have you read it? No, See? I haven't, I haven't, I haven't, <laughs> well, well, I've, I've, I've read through some, some of the, um, evolution mm -hmm. and I've definitely skimmed through the, the photos mm -hmm. more than just when you and I have gotten together, yeah. but like I have a copy here at the office and I've showed everyone here. And sometimes there's, there's been a couple of times where people have stopped by and I'm like, you guys should check this out. I'll, you know, someone's a veteran or they're in the military and I'll, we'll talk about this book and stuff. You know what I really love about what you did with that, the book and what you wrote is the table of contents, because, you know, when you buy, buy Hell Week is like HW, a little square, um, DP drown proofing, it's in a square. So you can we associate. people, we, mm -hmm. yeah, we people yeah. have never like gone through this, but we're just like, oh my gosh, what is, what's happening in this image? Darren has placed the, um, the, the HW for Hell Week, he's, every image has a square that tells you which evolution is happening. And it's so helpful because we're like, and then we go back and we're like, look at this. This yeah, is what what's is happening. This, yeah, this is what's happening here. And, uh, and it's really, Darren, it's at, that is such a service to us, <laughs> us novices who have no idea what we're looking about, looking at, but are just like, how are they even doing what they're doing? Yeah. It was interesting doing it that way because you know, you, you have to go in, we'd look at something, it's like, okay, is this the best way this is going to be? Because I got to go through it as someone that's never been through SEAL training. So my idea was just have a big block like Hell Week and then all those photos of Hell Week. And then the next block would be like, like build up to it. 
But then the problem that I had with that is it, is it didn't have any or, organic work, uh, work like vision flow. You know, it's like it was – it's kind of like sectioned off, which it might have worked. I don't know. But I, di I didn't want to do it that way after a while. I just want to – Intermix them all in and how you're looking through the book. Like so you go black and white, then there's pain, then there's some color photos, and it just it gives you a visual, um, like a visual roller coaster. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. I don't think I could do that just by blocking every evolution off and here's the photos of that. You mm -hmm. know, because if you have like one photo of log PT and you put like 30 of them together, you get bored at looking at log PT. Mm -hmm. It's right. like okay, this yeah yeah. You know, mm -hmm. so it's kind of like a, a, a wildlife book at Barnes and Noble. It's like, oh, here's zebras. And it's like 240 pictures of zebras. And it's like, OK, <laughs> that's the zebra, you know, so right. <laughs> so it was better to mix them all up. Nice. I will always love to hear the stories of how people got to where they were. So moments like this are really impactful. How did you get to this? So like you can go as far back as you'd like from when you remember, you're like, oh, like I had this vision for. Not not the photography, but maybe for the military or before we before we go to that point, I'm going to end our Facebook live that I have going on on my feed. Oh, yeah. OK, we're going to we need to leave a cliffhanger here. So I'm going to go turn that off. But I did want to mention if you can't wait to get to uh, have that book show up in the mail, you can tomorrow night come to Foundations Church at um Six o'clock, the doors open. Seven o'clock, Darren is going to be there presenting video, presenting images that have never been seen before. And you're going to hear stories about what, what has happened, what's taken place. You're going to be encouraged by the courage that <laughs> Darren and these guys have to go through this. So um, go to unconmigrate.com. You can get your ticket. Blue Studio, we have a promo code. You can get in for $10. If you go to uncommongrit.com. Promo code, type in blue, and that's B-L-U, studio, studio, 10. And that will get you a $10 ticket to get in tomorrow night. So be there, be square. We do have limited quantities of the book, so you can purchase the book ahead of time. And um, you can uh, pick it up there tomorrow night. It's going to be amazing. So, Do you have any VIP spots left? Or I'll, the, uh, have to, what, uh, I'll have to ask, ask Byrne. I think we had maybe two or three left. And so that's where someone could meet. Yes. yes. Be. From five to six, we have <laughs> Hell Week VIP reception yes, with Darren McBurnett. Yes. Only 20 people are going to be there. Um, we do have vendors there. We have um, Bedford Cameron Video as our presenting sponsor. We have Canon USA is going to be there. Um, Nelson Mazda will be there. They're having two vehicles there, and you may want to test drive one if you want mm. to. Yeah. Uh, we have Blacksmith Roofing also is there. And the um, Order of the Purple Hearts are going to be there. We have Navy Recruiting, which Navy Forged by the Sea is, uh, is what their their tagline is, as well as the coffee bunker will be there too with the table. And I'm trying to make sure I didn't forget anyone. I believe that's it, but there may there might be more, but come check it out. There's gonna be raffles. You're raffling mm -hmm. off some of your pictures, yeah. as well as we have 30 that's prints. Cool. These pictures that are in the book, we have, Darren sent us 30 of them. They're matted, they're gorgeous, they're huge. And those will be selling at the event. So you can come buy them there. Some raffled off mm -hmm. and yep. uh, with many more giveaways and whatnot. So that's it. So get your ticket at uncommongrit.com. We're going to end this infomercial for uncommongrit.com. <laughs> we'll see you back in a moment. Dang. <laughs> Just kidding. We're not leaving you guys. Yeah. No, what I was telling you that you had that first photo open with the, the guy in the. Uh... <clears throat> so. Oh, and that's my Easter egg too. I got to show you that. So yes. when I first- That's you, right? Yeah, that's me. So in the beginning of, actually, this that should go live. I can tell you about that. But go to the other, we're, we'll, we'll do that. We'll do that first. So that photo there. Now, this is very special. I want to tell you something about this one. Is uh, that the guy in the front of the log with the wave hitting him. Okay, that's, uh, was my Bud's instructor's son. So that's my, what my second phase bud instructor's name is Pete Wright. He was my bud's instructor back in 96. And it just thought it was, I, it just, it was just absolute destiny that that I knew that that was going to be the first photo. And by the way, every bud's class, you have about 10 people that are named Wright, five that are named Collins, five that are named like Anderson. It's the same, 
in the last name. So in Smith, there's really like nine Smiths per class. So I didn't put two and two together, but that was one of my favorite shots is that. And then uh, uh, Pete got the book and he goes, dude, you got my, it's like, I didn't know that was your son. He goes, yeah, that's my son. It's like, dude. So anyway, I thought that was really, really special. Uh, cool. That, you know, the guy that put me through buds is, was putting his son through buds. What kind of, what kind of uh, equipment did you use to capture? Uh, that I remember. had a, actually I had three cameras. I had a Canon 1DX. I had a Canon, um, my main one that my go-to was the Canon 5D Mark III. And then my underwater shots are all with an Aquatica housing with a, a cam, uh, Canon 5D uh, Mark II. With the, my, my, my go-to lenses was a 24 to 105. That's probably my biggest go-to lens. Uh, uh, the 14 millimeter fisheye, uh, 50 millimeter, um, prime. And then the, uh, 20, uh, 70, was it 28 to 200, 28 to 200 were my prime lenses. <clears throat> nice. So did you want to talk about the Easter egg that you got? Yeah. Here? So this was funny. This was actually really, really cool. Uh, cause we launched, I launched this on Instagram and because that's where it started. This is back when Instagram, you can actually sell stuff and they didn't interject. And back when it was like a free open market. Mm -hmm. So, and that was kind of like the benefit of having social media back in those days is the fact that you can just push something out, go to your website, you can link it up. And then uh, people went to your website, which now you have to pay for all those services. Uh, but back then to get into everyone interested in that, I, th I think I had like 60, uh, 75,000 or oh, 60,000 followers at that time. And, uh, so I did a couple of videos and I'm a huge Easter egg fan. I'm a huge movie fan and huge Easter egg fan. So I told people they look in there close enough. And I told them specifically read the intro. If you read the intro, you're going to start piecing and getting, you start finding, uh, P Easter eggs. If you find the correct Easter egg, uh, on it and the very first editions. Okay. Um, you'll go in. So in the back of the book, we don't have a first edition. It's not in this one. We took it out. It's only in the first editions. The first print runs is we had predator font in the back and you had to decipher it. Now I made it, I made it easy. Okay. I made it real freaking easy because if you Google predator font, it literally gives you ABCD in what it is. And so I just did like a decipher code and just did one freaking phrase. And I put it in the back of the book at the bottom. And I actually showed people where it was. It's on the bottom. You can find it. You have to decipher that code, and that code's going to take you on the hunt. You know, and it was all in predator code. And it was real easy. It was um, the, what I put out, it had to be, it was uh, from Aliens. It was a uh, uh, Private Vasquez character. It was like, I want to know one thing, where they are. And that's, and of course, everyone was like coming and going, oh, that's from Aliens. That's it's like, yeah, I literally <laughs> told you that was from Aliens. You know, but the whole point was to identify that line, identify the movie and start looking at, OK, why would he put this line in Predator font? And so then people came with hey, it's Alien versus Predator. So then they all go to Alien versus Predator and they just wanted this magical rabbit hunt, which I did by design because I wanted them to be in that, that multiverse forever. But the very first thing I said multiple times, even wrote it down, text put on the stories, put everything back then. It's like, just read the intro. That's all you got to do. Everything's hidden. I said, everything is hidden in the intro. And so if you open up the book to the intro. You want me to real quick? Yeah. And all you have to do is look at the photo of me. I'll let you kind of navigate us through it. Yeah. It's actually, it's so easy. It's sickening. So look at, look at the photo of me and what do you see in the center? Just there's in the, right in the center. It's literally right in front of you. What do you the, see? The top part right there just stands nope. up to me first. No, just go down to where my hands are mm -hmm. and what's in the middle. It's the egg right there. Yeah. It's the Easter egg right there. That's yes. the Easter egg. It's, it is. Okay. It's Batman. It's Frank Miller's Dark Knight's Batman. What? Yeah. Give, give me oh, book. wow. You're right. <laughs> oh, now I see the mask. Oh, my word. Ah! It's literally right in front of him. It is. That's awesome. <laughs> wow. That is so yeah. cool. 
That's the that's one of the older ones. Yeah, right? it's from it's from, from uh, like, Frank Miller's the the Dark Knight Returns. Like, mm-hmm. That's a good one. Yeah, it's right in the middle. That's and that's what I literally told people. It's literally in the intro, right in front of you. I'm not going to get on a tangent, but I wasn't a big fan of the Joker movie. Yeah, the last one. Oh, it's awful. It, like it was not very good. Mm-hmm. Um, and and in the newest one with um, uh, oh man, what's his name? Jared Leto. He, oh, hated the new Batman. Hated yeah. the new Batmans. They were terrible. So yeah. um, the one, Christian Bale and Michael Keaton yeah. were, I think, one of the best Batmans. Like 1992 yep. or 93 with the original OG Joker mm-hmm. was, I think, the best Batman. 100%. I, I love, like, if you look at how they did Batman, it, it, uh, I love Michael Keaton's always be the original Batman. Uh, Frank Miller's, I'm still waiting for Frank Miller to do his version of the Batman because if you, if you, like, if you, I mean, if everyone goes and write the Dark Knight from Frank Miller, I mean, if how they haven't made that into movies beyond me, because that's the ultimate, you know. But mm-hmm. I did. I love Michael Keaton. Um, believe it or not, I thought Val Kilmer did a really good job. Val Kilmer did a good job too. Yeah. Well, uh, what was that Mister Freeze? Yeah. With yeah, that one. That whole right, one was just stupid. Yeah. That one was there was dumb, and then there was idiotic, and then there was below all that. I feel like they were a little cheesy. They yeah, that one better. got real cheesy real quick. It they yeah. they. Twisted it to like they tried to be old school '60s Batman and Robin is what they kind of turned it yeah. into, and it was dumb. Even even George Clooney could even like nobody could save that one. <laughs> it's gone. Nobody could. I mean, yeah, Christian Bale did perfect Batman. Christian Bale. Oh yeah, yeah, he's the one that played in uh, in Dark Knight. Yeah, the Dark Knight and all. And the, the two other series after that. Yep, he did. He did really good. Mm-hmm. I I thought Ben Affleck did well with his, but the latest one, yeah, was yeah. I was like, no thanks. <laughs> no way. No, thank you. Okay, so I got a question. Yeah. So you've got this really cool predator outfit. Yeah. And you've mentioned the word predator a few times. Mm-hmm. Was that a nickname for you? Uh, no. Was that a code was, name or something at some no, point? No, I, I was just a big predator fan. I even put it in the book. It's like I give I give thanks and credence. And I think one of the things I put in there is like. It would have surprised me if they were like predator. Or yeah, predator. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wish. I, I wasn't that cool. But uh, yeah, the, the Predator, I was like, you know, the, I think just, he's, he's just an awesome superhero, you know. Um, but uh, I just think that whole, because plus that was probably one of the first R movies I got to sneak into in the theaters <laughs> back then. But it was like a really just, I like the whole thing about him. Like, but of course with Predator is, they've totally missed the mark on Predator 100%. They, they, it's just like, if you really want to embrace that movie, you have to have the movie. It's just about predators on their home world with no humans in there, with no human dialoguing. Zero. Let the visuals take where they are and why. It's like, why do they just go to every other world and destroy everything and like hunt and make themselves better? Why has, what's the purpose behind that? Go back to the purpose, you know, create your characters, mm-hmm. create the, I want to know the background. And they're not doing that. They in, inject people and dialoguing and it always makes it horrible. So, <laughs> so I want, I was going back to that one conversation before we did the shout out and had to cut off Facebook. Uh, I want to know the background. Like, how did you get to where you are? Oh, geez. What are your impactful moments that have kind of come to mind? And you can be a little sporadic with it, but. What, as far as in like in life or yeah. just how did I get here? How'd you get in the seat today? Uh, <laughs> from 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 the photographic journey to I had to know, drive Pam like. here. <laughs> <laughs> I needed a ride. <laughs> Bernie needed the car. <laughs> oh, it's. I mean, that's you know, uh, life's just a journey, man. It's it's. There's, you know, one of the big things that I really love is is you know if and uh, I forgot who said it, but it was so true. I've always kind of wondered, you know, where it all ends. What's the end state? And so. One of the big things that we have in our country is the illusion that there's a thing called retirement. And then when you get done with that, then you can sit back and finally do the things you want to do and and do nothing. And I totally disagree with that. I don't think you should ever retire. You just find new things and keep going. And so the journey keeps going. So if you uh, love the walk more than the destination, everything that goes along with that walk is just those are all side effects. Those are all accolades. Those are all accomplishments and achievements that are all subsidiary to you continuing on that journey. And you don't know where that journey is going to end. You don't. There's no des- There's no destination. People that just want the destination, all they'll do is try to do whatever they can to get to the destination. When they're there, they kind of don't know what they do because they have an idea what that destination is. 
It's like, I don't know what my destination is going to be. I just know that I'm just keep going on this path. And then everything else is just, you know, accolades and, and side effects of the journey. And so me being here is just another, another part of the journey that, uh, that just happened to happen. I've been know? reminded that it's so important to, to stay focused on, on a vision. Um, and then a, another comment to that is there's a lot of people who are like, who will say so-and-so is successful and they're like, oh, wow, you're successful. And everyone's got their own different version of a pedestal, putting somebody else on a pedestal and mm-hmm. look it up and be like, oh, you made it, mm-hmm. right? Because they're the different perspectives or whatever. And in my mind, I'm like, oh, well, I never really want to make it because then I feel like I'm, st- I've quit pursuing a passion, yeah. right? That's well said. It's, it's, it's plus with that is what's your definition of success? And when I'm doing my motivational speaking, that's one of the biggest questions I tell people to do their homework. I tell them this, your only homework assignment, write down what your definition of success is. And that's going to change how you look at it. That's going to change, maybe not you, but it's going to change the perspective of what you're doing. So you have to have what your version of success is, you know? And so a lot of it you'll find, a lot of it's like what you're saying. It's, 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 it's monet, it's a uh, monetized, it's money. Mm-hmm. It's, they want the cars, they want the house. I'm in power was a big one you know, I'm in charge finally, and they want to th- be at the top. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and that's not for everybody. Like you said, it's not, you know, and so that's, that's a, that's a good key point that, uh, that I talk about quite a bit. When, um, what, what made you go into the Navy? And, um, and at what age? I went in at, uh, I went after college. So I went, I went in in 90, uh, 93, uh, December of 93 when I joined because I had a family history of being in the Navy and uh, the military. And I knew growing up and being a military brat that I liked that lifestyle because I've always been very structured growing up. That was just me. I've always, I've always had, uh, uh, I wouldn't necessarily say discipline in my life, but I was always very structured and I had order. Mm-hmm. Okay. And that's growing up in military family and plus very conservative um, lineage, you know, grandparents and great grandparents, especially in Indiana, it's like everything was very strict. Everything was very in order, tidy. And that's how I kind of liked my life. And, uh, the military was like, I knew, I just knew I was going to go. And, uh, and I went in, just went in the Navy. You know, I, I didn't, didn't plan on being there that long. I was going to do four or five years, I guess, and then get out and go do something else is what I wanted to do. Uh, at least I thought, just get in. And then, uh, uh, one thing led to another, like I said, it's the journey, man. So, uh, you go back a little bit of me in high school, uh, and before high school, I accidentally got into running because I'm in that generation where we just, you know, you ran everywhere you went, you rode your bike and you ran everywhere. You played dodgeball, you played kickball, you know, uh, no one moseyed, nobody walked. Everyone had a purpose. My that purpose boys, was to I have win. to kick them out of the house. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. And we, me, me, I was like, I was out, outside playing in a creek bed, yeah. building forts. I dug like a six foot moat. Mm-hmm. I'm like 12 years old. <laughs> yeah. Right. And it, it was like, like five feet by like six feet deep. And I put like sticks and whatever over the top. And then I'd like, the other kids would come back there and I'd used to mm-hmm. like dig little holes and then put like twigs and stuff over the top. And then one of them actually got out of my base and he fell in the trap and yeah, then went home crying, awesome. but like stuff like that, like yeah. my boys, I, I'm encouraging them to get out of the house. But a lot of the kids nowadays, they're just like, yeah, they don't want to. And that's on the tube. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, you know, that's like a generational thing, man. For us, it was, um, that's us. We, 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 I grew up in a culture of winning. Okay. And if you didn't win anything or you get, if you didn't get picked first or second, then you were last period. That's like Ricky Bob is so truth for our gen, like the generation I grew up in. It's like, you ain't first, you're last. If you ain't being picked first or you ain't being picked in the first top five, then you're a loser. You didn't get a trophy Nothing, for participating. Zero. Your, your, your trophy was you actually walked home without it. it the, the, our version of winning something is you won everything that we did and you went home without a skin knee, a bloody nose or something ripped <laughs> off your clothes. Or that broken. Or broken. <laughs> that, that's, that's how I grew up. You know, it's like we fought, we ran with like everything. It's almost like it was Lord of the Flies growing up in, in my generation. <laughs> it's like everyone went out and we just literally wanted to murder everything and everybody. That was it. If we even tag, it just ended up everybody punching one another. God forbid we played tackle football, which we all always did. And someone <laughs> like we'd all get hurt. Some would cry. And then they they get done crying. Would we kick them out until they got done crying? 
<laughs> because the, mo- the the biggest motivation in the world is it, for me is being benched. That was the biggest motivation. Like, you no know, no books will say anything. No, uh, what's your motivation? It's like being benched. You know, this, what, you can't participate in anything because, you know, you're weak. And so weakness wasn't a thing that we looked at growing up. It's like, if you're weak, get, get out of here, you know? And, and if you were weak, we picked on you the most. What does that mean? Uh, you, there was no fire. Okay. You have people that have fire and you have people that don't, and you can recognize it right away. Like simply like playing kickball or a uh, wall ball or baseball or football or anything that we played as a kids was the fact that, you know, if you're just there and you're not participating and you're kind of like do as minimal as humanly possible because you don't want to get hurt, you were the weak one. You know, mm-hmm. you're the one that like mm-hmm. we went after first to make sure you cried because when you start crying, then you're automatically out of the game. <laughs> That's fair enough. Yep. <laughs> what were we talking about before we went on that touch subject? Oh, how but talking that, about history and stuff. Yeah, that was me. Yeah. So I like I ran fast. So when in a, I ended up running track in eighth grade, you know, and that was it. So I had a PE teacher that looked a lot like um, uh, the Macho Man Randy Savage, you know, <laughs> because we ran everywhere we went, and so we had to run around the the field to start PE, and I always won it. Not that I'm like wanted to beat everybody or anything else. It just that was that culture of you ran everywhere you went. So, all right, we got to run. And then what's next? You know, but I won them all the time. And so she said, you should go for track. So I started track. Um, and then that led to cross country. And then that led to doing road races, do fought from 5Ks to 8Ks to 10Ks to 25Ks to marathons. And then that led to doing biathlons. And then that led to triathlons. And then, you know, so that's my whole high school career was just like track, cross country, indoor track, swim team triathlons and biathlons. That was my whole high school. It's a lot of cardio. It was a lot of cardio. <laughs> it was a lot of work, but also it was a lot of jobs because I had to pay for it all. Um, and that was my life. You know, people talk about trigger events. I was, that was, I don't know why, but that's what I did. And I internally enjoyed it. And so with that, you know, I learned a lot of things about yourself when you're doing it because they say it wasn't taught. It was just there. You know, it just, you know, it just happened. And so then you start learning about work ethic. You start working about competitive drive, start working about teamwork. You start learning structure. You start learning like order. You start learning fearlessness. Uh, you start learning, um, you know, what motivation actually is, the definition of it. Uh, and you start going along on this path where I was different from everybody else. And and I can't explain it, just the fact that, like, when I ran, the best way I can describe it is I'm running and I'm doing triathlons or anything else. I did my first Ironman when I was 17, did Boston Marathon when I was 16. Uh, it's the fact that when I got done with doing anything, it's it wasn't like, it, in my head, it wasn't that, the thought process of, was it hard or I never want to do it again. That was exhausting. That was too much effort to put into that. None of those thoughts ever ended and entered my mind. The only thing that entered my mind when I completed anything was how do I do it better and faster the next time? Hmm. That was it. And I don't know how to explain that or tell people where they can buy that or read about that. It's internal. It's intrinsic. Would you say it's hard? It's difficult for you to be satisfied? Um, or content? I, or done? Or yeah, you know, done, finished? Yeah. Like... Like I did it. I'm done. Good. Moving on. Yeah. No. Like, yeah, you are just, you like, ah, no, I need, I need more. I need better. It needs to yeah, be let's move bigger, on to the next faster. Thing. Or, yeah. Just move on to the next thing. You know what I like about what you just said there, Darren, is you weren't, you had a healthy comparison. You weren't comparing yourself. Like, am I as good as the other person? Am I, you were like, am I, you know, am I better? Am I doing this better than what I did last time? Or, you know, next time I'm going to do this better. I'm going to. Yeah. And so you're comparing yourself to your previous achievement and like, okay, how can I improve that? And that I think is so important because then, cause we, we only have control over ourselves. Mm-hmm. We don't have control over other people and what they do and, and what their experiences are. So when you're comparing yourself to yourself, that's an honest comparison and you are the one that really has control and the gauge over where, where that goes. So that's so good. Yeah. You know, it's like, you're right. And that's kind of like what you, you, what you were alluding to was, um, uh, are you leaving? (laughs) (laughs) 
uh, what you what you were um, talking about was uh, is I don't get there is no like end state or I get bored with things. The only thing that is, is like I did that. Maybe I can do something else. It's like I think we're talking about the car a little bit. It's like doing triathlons and like doing the Ironman disc triathlons. It's like, is that what I want to do forever? Do I enjoy it? Yes. Was it fun? Yes. Was the training hard? Yes. You know, was it satisfying? Yes. Is this one I'd want to do forever? Is just keep doing Ironman triathlons or triathlons or road races? Yeah, I'll still do them. But will I get bored? Yeah. It's like I've done this. I've done this. I know what it's like to do this. So like I did my second Ironman in 2007, just because the opportunity presented itself. So it's like, okay, now that I'm going to do this, now I have to structure my day. I have to make sure that I can do all these events and do them well and I have to train for each one of them and throughout the day. And so along with work, you know, and having girls at the time. So it's kind of like now you're training at 1030 at night. Now, now you're on the weekends, you're up at four or three trying to get things done and you have to look at how you want to do it. And so you look at your life and it's like, do I want to do this and structure my entire life out of doing these? Cause it's what I love to do. Or do you just want to move on to something else or find another challenge and attack that one and then go, maybe go do another Ironman, you know, later on or another bulk event. So like my last marathon I did was a New York city marathon. It's like 2014 or 15. Not that I hate to do marathons or anything else. It's like, okay, that was a cool marathon. I don't need to do them every year, every day, every weekend, every other weekend you know, the marathon season, you know, just like, okay, I did that one. Now let's do something else. And so do I want to do, I do, do a marathon again? Yeah. Oh, well, fire inch one and maybe I'll start training for it and I'll go back and do it again. You know, it's like, so I know that I can do it. Do I want to do it? Sure. Are there other things out there I want to do? Yeah. Let's go pursue other things. Where was your headspace at? Do you think high school, college, or are you more focused on, on yourself and the admirations of where you wanted to go? Were you, were, were there things where you're maybe you noticed where you weren't on the right path or do you feel like you were consistently focused on that vision and maintaining that path? Right. Did you ever feel like you deterred off? Oh yeah. All the time, man. <laughs> like girls, like yeah, girls, girls come away and you're yeah. like, oh man, okay, well now I'm not going to do that marathon or you know, yeah. I lack the training for whatever it is or. Yeah. Girl, girls throw you off your groove real quick, you know? <laughs> so. Yeah. We can't help it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, girls, freaking, you know, whatever lifestyle you led. I mean, it, it just, it, it always throws you for a loop, but life throws you for a loop sometimes. You know, you got to, like I say, when I got done with college, I didn't know what it, it's like. I knew I wanted to join the military, so I should have did it in high school. You know, so um, you're always going to be throwing loops. You're always, because life's going to come at you and uh, you have to figure out how you're going to deal with it. So what I like to tell people is uh, life and uh Life is, well, experience, I think life is experience. So ex- that's about 10%. 10% of the day you live or your life that you live is experience. The other 90% is how you deal with the experience. Mm. So whatever happens to you, how are you going to deal with it? It's the, res- mm. it's the response. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So uh, that's kind of like me. And so you just got to keep going. You got to figure it out. And things aren't always going to go your way. You're going to get sidetracked. And sometimes sidetracked leaves you away from one thing, but all of a sudden it puts you on something else. It's like, oh, okay. You start doing that. So like, I didn't expect to be a SEAL or go to BUDS or anything like that. I didn't know what the hell it was, you know, but it ended up, that's where I ended up. <laughs> is, there, is there anything that you do in particular to kind of get back on track? Like there's some tools or strategies or ideas or mindsets where you're like, I don't know. We all get so far off track. Sometimes it's hard to get back on. Mm-hmm. Is there yeah. anything that that you've done to where it's kind of like, all right, this this is how I get back on track, to where I know, or I'm I'm in my zone. I'm yeah. comfortable. I'm headed in the right direction. Yeah, like know? a life. Yeah, your life's resets and things like that 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 you need. You know, but it all depends on what's going on at that time. You know, it's like, um, you know, it's it's hard to really tell how to get back on the track that you're on. It's like, okay, what track are you on? Number one, and if you do get off that track. You're right. How do you get back on that track? And that's just how you. Um, and in my, in my idea you, this comes down to the little actions that you have to take to kind of get back on track. Yeah. So like if you're like, OK, well, I want to do these marathons. I need to continue doing these. I haven't been to training mm-hmm. for them. 
okay, well then I need to start by waking up earlier. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. Need to start by eating a little healthier. I need to start by walking in the morning and running in the afternoon and taking the dog. I don't know, whatever else, you know what I mean? I feel like it kind of starts with those actions, right? Yeah. It's, it, you know, it's the, the a base of how you can say that is <laughs> if you do marathons, or you want to do a marathon or anything else and you're off track, you know, the, the best thing to get back on track is to sign up for a marathon. And now you have eight months. Now, tick tock, tick tock. Now you got to go, <laughs> you know, so time's passing away. So the best way that I found that if I get off track, then I sign up for something or I go do something that I know that it puts me on a more disciplined timeline. And now I have to, because if you just, oh, I want to, you're just running to run. Right. And let's say, yeah, I've done marathons, but gosh, I want to do a marathon. And you start getting up early and start training for one, but you haven't signed up for one. Well, guess what's going to happen? you know, you'll fall off real freaking quick again because you haven't set that you're going to do that marathon. So, or 50 K or whatever, you know, so when you sign up for something, now you're locked in. So, okay, I locked in, I got on the calendar. This is what I, I'm training to this. And now you work your timeline backwards where you want to be. And that's a lot easier once you've already settled that you're going to do something. So as we get closer to wrapping up this episode, it's challenging to kind of find, find your grit. Um, for, I mean, for a lot of people, you know, and like if you're not first or second, you're last. <laughs> yeah. That was, um, yeah. <laughs> and you gotta, you gotta have grit. And, um, a lot of people have said that business owners have a lot of grit or at least the ones that make it 10 years in five, five plus years in at least. Cause there's a lot of financial, emotional, mm -hmm. there's people you got to support. Like you got to be pretty level headed you got to know a lot of different areas of stuff. And so that's just one area to where I could relate to having a lot of grit. And I've been told that that's, I'm constantly finding my grit, man. Like, um, but you, I, I don't know if I really have a question behind that. It's more of just well, a grit. statement of just yeah. like finding, finding grit, man. Like I actually, I have a, a question for Darren. Darren, you, um, did free fall. Yeah. And you were an instructor and created, he created a complete program. Tell us about that and how like you created that and what that was. Yeah. We just uh, like free fall was interesting. Um, like the program we created, we, we, we like, we created like all of the, the standard operating procedures for free fall, you know, out where we were in New Arizona and we did it for the Navy, you know, just getting all the, what we had to do, like to do it properly, you know? And so and then I created like a lot of the, the, the audio visuals. You know, it's like because the only way you're going to learn in free fall is you you have to see yourself. If you can't see yourself in free fall, you're never going to learn. And that's having video in free fall is it was it was very it, in free fall. When I got into free fall, it was it was still in the nascent stages. It's very, very new because they had these cameras became these big, huge cameras like you should see the ones they used in um, Maverick. Yeah. Point break. Okay. Point break. Yeah, yeah. That was like, cause I had some buddies of mine, like, um, uh, Wallace, uh, and those guys that revolutionized cameras. Cause they're jumping with these big VHS recorders on their heads. <laughs> like literally mm -hmm. no kidding. Like literally trying to be trying to get those shots because the nineties camcorders huge. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's what they used. And it's a no kidding. And no one had had a camera on their freaking head taking photos at the same time. That was ridiculous. And so that whole evolve, evolvement was something that, that just kept going. And I, and I, I was really cool that, that I took that to a whole different level as digital photography and the cameras got smaller to be able to mirror those things up and actually come up with like really cool videos, really cool freaking photography because it's, because it was just like a learning tool, man. You couldn't really get a lot unless you had like the air skill to get it as well. And so building that up was like really a lot of fun. And it was like, got to the point where the stuff that I can do aerial with it was, was, um, was like, like hands down. People tell me, it's like, dude, we ain't never seen anything like that. You know? <laughs> so, but the whole point is you got to teach your students and teach your students. Like I couldn't imagine trying to teach a student military free fall if they couldn't see what the hell they were doing. And that's what they did for years. Cause they didn't have video. You know, it's like, you tell somebody straighten out their legs. They have no idea how to straighten out their legs in the air especially when you're going 140 miles an hour screaming toward the, toward the earth. It's like, how, how do I lift my legs out? You know? So it was mm -hmm. probably a lot tougher teaching guys free fall way back in the day. Mm -hmm. Now it's like simple. You shoot the video and it's like, okay, we give you this hand signal. That means you put your legs out and you can see it in the video. It's like, oh, okay. I get it. So 
And t uh, tomorrow night, I got a, a glimpse into the video of, <laughs> or one of the videos where Darren is filming the free fall and this I, I like could hardly breathe watching what was happening with this guy. And you're jumping, just jumping. Yeah. And yeah, he, yeah, I'll jump first. You got a parachute. And, he's yeah. probably eating Twinkies okay. as he's jumping, yeah, you know. Just jumping, just finding the perfect light, watching this guy just, just sky trash. <laughs> That's freaking hilarious. It's funny. Yeah. So I thought about doing it. Would you do it? No. Nope. Mm -mm. Would your husband? I don't know. Bernie might. Yeah, huh. Bernie might. Yeah, Bernie might. I, I yeah. think Bernie would. Yeah, he probably would. No, no, thank you. The plane, <laughs> I, I... I'll stay in my seat, buckle. Yeah, I have no bucket list that includes uh, jumping out of a perfectly good though. airplane. The, I think what's fun about fun about it was, first of all, it's it's very exhilarating, but when you're in the military free fall, and the back of that ramp, the C-130 opens up, yeah. and then you walk out on the edge, there's not a whole lot of feelings like that that you can create on the ground. Like there's not a lot of life you can lead that that will give you that sensation. True. I mean, especially you're at sixteen thousand feet and that ramp just opens and you just see the earth below you and you're like literally standing on the edge, like watching. And then you go through clouds and clouds. It's just it, it's it, it's something that you if you don't do it, I, I'm not going to say you're like I don't know. It's I don't know what I'm trying to say. What I'm trying to say is it was a feeling and a visual visually and emotionally just standing on the edge of the ramp. Getting ready to jump out, you can't you can't duplicate that unless you do it. Some people will call you crazy jumping out of a perfectly good yeah. airplane. <laughs> well, you <laughs> just have, kidding. You, well, you got to be a little crazy, a little bit of grit, yeah. right, to jump out of an airplane. Yeah, you got to have that fearlessness. <laughs> yeah, you know, like I want to try that. You know, and uh, that well, you got two chances to live. You're main in reserve, so you got that. But that's also going back to growing up. How do you get fearlessness into your body without doing anything, without going outside? It's like for us, it's it's like I'm writing about it right now. It's just simple, a simple thing is climbing a tree when I was younger. You know, we we looked at trees as which one we're going to build a fort in, which one was close to another tree that we can jump from limb to limb, which one is going to be base for us, which one. Yep. That, I mean, we moved anywhere. The first thing we found was the trees. And that's the first thing we did was climb them. Like you moved to a new house, the first thing you did was climb the tree. Mm -hmm. And it was just to see if you can get on the roof, number one, and there's any, can we jump off the roof at a certain place? Or is there another tree we can jump from the roof onto the tree? Because you got to be able to travel. Yeah, you got to be able to travel. And plus, when you're playing hide and seek, when you're playing capture the flag, you gotta find the when you're spots. shooting BB guns at one another, you got to <laughs> find those positions of, of yep. those defensive positions. And all you could do that is like climbing trees, getting where you needed to go. And so that's fearlessness, just looking at a tree that's like 60 feet in the air and you're looking, how can you get to the top? You know, and that's kind of like that when the ramp opens. Oh, cool. I'm going to jump. This is awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you do, we're, we're coming up close to our hour here. Um, if someone wanted to hire you to speak, is is that a thing that you do? Yeah, sure. Yeah. I, I, I like, is it my website, McB at dmcburnett.com, man. Just call me up. That's where I get a lot of my stuff from, but I'm part of two brief speaking beers. One's engage. Uh, they're my newest one. And uh, leading authorities out of D.C. Engage that L.A. leading authorities out of um, D.C. Uh, yeah, that's but most people, they'll email or they'll just email me and they'll like call them back and say, yeah, man, whatever you want. Yeah. So I'm easy because cool. speaking because speaking is a privilege, to be honest with you. When you're on stage, it's a privilege to be up there to to give all my experiences and people get takeaways from. You know, it's easy for as I tell them, Pam, we're doing this. I'm like, you guys are doing the hard part. My part's easy. Once I'm on stage, I'm done. I was like, it's pageant wave a yep, little bit. Yep, that's it. Then it's because <laughs> a lot of people say they can't talk. They can't speak in front of people. You know, they, they don't want to. It's like it's like for me, that's pretty much the only thing in my life that's come natural for some weird reason. <laughs> it's like, I, but uh, I'll yeah. take some of that juice. Mm. Do you have any? Yeah. Do you have any questions, Pam? Uh, no, I just thoughts? appreciate you, you know, having having us in the studio today with with uh, Darren, as I call him, but McBee to everybody else. I uh, have McBee here in the studio and just people being able to hear. He has one of the most unique stories. This is the most unique creative mm -hmm. seal mm -hmm. on the planet. <laughs> and when when you his photo the photography, Darren, what you see in your mind's eye, you've been able to capture that and present it to us and where you show 
yes, you can do something mm -hmm. that you don't think you possibly can do. And you've done it and so many others have done it and that we all can do so much more. And we just got to be willing to, you know, put in the hard work, put in the time, get up earlier. Ever since actually Darren and I've been working with him on this event, I've been getting up so early. It's, <laughs> it's, I'm like, you've woken up the baby seal in me. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it's been awesome because I always said I was an aspiring morning person. And I feel like I'm much closer to that now with getting up at, you know, it, you know, six, five, four, or I was doing something and getting ready for this. Oh, I was editing some headshot jobs and I, I was up Wednesday morning and went to bed one o'clock Friday morning and that whole time. And it's like, yes, we can be sleep deprived and still accomplish yes, what we you need can. to do. And he, Darren is living proof of that. <laughs> yes, you can. Do you have any yep. kids? Yes, I have three. My son's like 27 now. Uh, he's like a physical therapist. And my youngest daughter is my, my oldest daughter just graduated Fresno state. She's on her way to Oregon. And uh, my youngest daughter is her, finished out her sophomore year at uh, UC Davis. So I've got two boys, eight, and nine and a little girl due on Monday. There, whoa. Mm -hmm. What are you doing in here? Yes. <laughs> She's still working too. Uh, <laughs> when you, you called me this morning, he called and said, Hey, I got a problem. I'm like, Oh, her water broke. Oh my word. It's not happening. She's been having contractions for the last two weeks. Eee. Oh Yikes. boy. It's coming. Probably mm -hmm. come yeah. today. Yeah. You know? Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'll no. be happy to go home. I'm gonna, <laughs> we want to come Monday so we can come to your later. event tomorrow like, night, yeah. Darren. Come to yes. event. Yeah. That's going to be fun. Yeah. <laughs> I promised my boys it's been, I told them, I was like, t after tomorrow, I was like, I'm not working for a couple of weeks. And yeah. they were so excited because they're like, dad, you work all the time and stuff like that. And so I'm going to take them that we just moved to a new house last weekend. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Okay. I do it all. And it's two yeah, weeks, it, man. man. <laughs> take those kids out, put them in the creek. I used to play in the creek bed at grandma's house all day. And there's a creek bed in our neighborhood now. Oh. And so I want to take them down there, but also kind of take them to a couple stores, maybe to Walmart and TJ Maxx or something like that. Find some wall decor, make them feel comfortable in the new place, sure. stuff like that. There so, you go. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Um, but the book, if I wanted to buy the book, best place is to? McB at dmcburnett.com. Okay. And then you can, of course, when you Google it, it'll take you all to like all the other places. That, but like I said, it, it's everywhere. I mean, you can walk into Barnes and Noble, if, you know, get it there or you can get it on it. Yeah. That's Amazon. where I got mine. Yeah. Or get it on my website. Yeah. Website, mm -hmm. Amazon, yep. Barnes and Noble. Mm -hmm. Just Google search. Uncommon, Uncommon grit, grit, you know. Okay. It's easy. Yeah. Fair enough. I'm honored to have you in the studio. Oh, thank it's, you. It's an honor to be here, man. It's a pleasure to like kind of get to know you a little bit better and more of an intimate setting. Um, you know, not not very many people have this opportunity. So it's it's pretty cool to to share this moment with you. And I really appreciate your service to this country. And it, it aligns perfectly with Memorial Day. Mm -hmm. just passing, you know, that we have this, this opportunity to do this. And I don't know if you aligned the event to happen the week after Memorial Day or not, but. Everything's been planned. Yes. <laughs> Everything's been planned. <laughs> it's a. Uh, I say it's like, yes, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, everything's planned, but. Right. I say like people like, people thank me for our service all the time, you know, and I'm like, I've just proven that you can do something with a humanities degree. <laughs> mm. <laughs> right. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> uh, well. Well, cool. Yeah. Well, um, no final thoughts? Um, any any key takeaways, final thoughts? No, that's uh, plenty. Mm -hmm. I, we, there's all sorts of nuggets in there that people can chew on. Oh, man. Thank you, Darren. You got I'm it. Excited. Thank you so much. Appreciate you guys. Yeah, and we'll see thanks. you next time on the next episode. And if you got any feedback, please leave a review down in the, in the comments or wherever you're listening so then others can uh, hear about the podcast. Um, if you guys have any other recommendations for upcoming episodes, let me know as well. And uh, signing off, we'll see you guys next time. Oh, well, you got something? Go ahead. Uh, beep, over beep, at, rewind. at Instagram, Uncommon Grit Events is where you'll find different little things about the event coming up tomorrow night and see some different content on there. So check that out and uh, give them a follow. Yeah, hopefully you see everybody. It's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, for yeah. you TikTokers, yeah, go follow, follow uh, Mc, uh, McB over here. On Instagram, <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's, it's, it's only because stuff. I can't I, I can't do all the social media ones. Like I like I have enough energy for one, and that's it. Yeah, so that's why it's on Instagram. Mm -hmm. I barely have enough for one. Yeah, barely enough for like I I can't. I've got to be on all of them. That's my job. Jeez, <laughs> right? It's like it's exhausting doing that one. It's like even that. It's like I literally, and it's not that it's a bad thing. It's I I'll probably get about 150 direct messages a day easily 
on it, just asking questions or they'll comment on something. And if I slip on that, it, it, it'll get to the point where I'll like, oh, I don't have it's. But anyway, but the thing about Instagram that people don't understand or any social media platforms and you understand because you're in it is the fact that you have to engage with your audience. If you don't, they will go away. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's the biggest thing. A lot of people are just complacent with it or they think they're celebrities or well, I'm an influencer now or I don't know what the hell that means. But it's a fact that just like anything else, if you don't engage with them, they'll go away. Mm -hmm. And oh, one last thing, Darren, we need to, if you want to have a unique experience, Medusa barbecue sauce. Oh, that's right. That's another thing I go down. Yes, that's fine. <laughs> you know, I, I keep wanting to add a sound effect on here. I don't know what it needs to sound like. Yeah. Maybe like but, a snake or like a, like a rattle. Ooh. That would be cool. Yes. But I was thinking of something that would initiate a shout out. You know, anytime like there's like moments like this mm -hmm. towards like, oh, we need a shout out. Oh, yeah. Shout out. Or yeah, something. I don't. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right? I yeah, like I that. Yes. Rattle, snake, rattler would be worse. Yeah. Or like a certain sound where yeah. like, shout out. <laughs> right. Shout it. Sure. You yeah. definitely need that. Yeah. So, um, that's not, it's not a built in button in there. You got to, well, yeah, I mean, we can build in whatever buttons for whatever sounds that we want, but it doesn't come stock. Okay. It's not OEM. Yet. You can create it. <laughs> like I could like do a voice over him and say, shout out or something like that. Or you could Darren for him. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but anyways, Darren's Instagram though is <laughs> Darren. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. It's, it's McTeams3842. So M C T E A M S 3842. And on there is a link to his barbecue sauce. Yeah, the sauce. barbecue sauce. Yeah, that's right. The Medusa's Kiss barbecue sauce, which is fun. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm bringing Medusa back. I think she got a bad rap if you look at her history. Right. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Darren did the artwork for the, yeah, uh, for did the, the bottle. for it. It's very cool. We got some bottles coming. I should, they should be yes. here today. Awesome. Buy them online? Yes. Medusa's Kiss barbecue.com. I love sauces. Oh, yeah. Try it out, man. We'll, we'll send you We'll send you some. We'll okay. run it over. Absolutely. All right. Any other last thoughts? No, no. Think about no, it. That no. was second to the last. To the do. last. To yeah, the we can do a second closing. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm all down for that. Yeah. Well, sure. This is a show style anyways. That's the way I like to do my stuff. Mm -hmm. Like it can be like some talking points, but show style. Like yeah. whatever happens, happens. Mm -hmm. yeah, cool. I love it. Well, all we, good, man. Thank you, Brady. I appreciate you. Well, thank you guys too for joining and uh, we'll see you next time.